so yeah, my name's Thomas Klein. I'm working on my PhD with Pejman, Suki, and also Martin Ebbett. And today I'm going to talk to you um, about my PhD project, which is in flash radiation therapy. So I'll start um, with a brief introduction. So basically, flash radiation therapy involves the delivery of radiation at ultra-high dose rates, which can be in excess of 40 grays per second. So there have been a lot of recent preclinical studies which have shown that flash radiotherapy has the ability to significantly reduce normal tissue toxicities while maintaining the same tumour response as conventional radiation therapy. So it has the potential to improve the therapeutic ratio. So this differential sparing of healthy tissues has been referred to as the flash effect. So I'll start with a few studies that highlight uh, the significance of flash radiotherapy. So in 2014, uh, Forvidon et al. irradiated the thoraxes of six mice with 17 gray, delivered at both conventional and flash dose rates. So at 36 weeks post-irradiation, he noted that the mice irradiated at conventional dose rates exhibited moderate to severe pulmonary fibrosis, while the mice who were irradiated at flash radiotherapy rates in or experience significantly less pulmonary fibrosis. And these results um, are illustrated in this graph here. So you can see the red is the conventional dose rates and the blue is flash <coughs> dose rates. And this is the incidence of pulmonary fibrosis versus weeks after radiation. So the difference was actually so great in the incidence of pulmonary fibrosis that the authors worked out that they could in fact deliver 30 grays at flash radiotherapy dose rates in order to induce the same incidence of pulmonary fibrosis in these mice, which is a potential dose escalation of about 75%. So the authors further noted at 24 hours post-irradiation that the signaling of TGF beta, which is a molecular marker for pulmonary fibrosis, was three times greater in the mice that were exposed at conventional dose rates. So other authors, such as this author Monte Gruel, has also uh, found that for the case of whole brain irradiation in mice, mice irradiated at flash radiotherapy dose rates um, were significantly less impaired in their spatial memory. So in this study, all mice were irradiated with a whole brain dose of 10 grays, with dose rates ranging from 0.1 grays per second right up to 10 grays delivered in 1.8 microseconds. So the authors noticed that the mice who were irradiated at 0.1 grays per second performed significantly worse on an object recognition test compared to the unirradiated control mice, while mice who were irradiated at dose rates greater than 30 grays per second performed significantly better. In particular, the authors noted that mice which were irradiated at 100 grays per second or more actually showed no, stati no statistical difference compared to the unirradiated mice in their spatial memory retention. So a very recent study in 2019 used flash radiotherapy for the treatment of six cats. So these cats all had squamous cell carcinoma of the nasal, squamous cell carcinoma of the nasal plenum, and they were treated with very high fractional doses to very small treatment volumes. Now, all of these six cats responded positively to the treatment with complete remission. And despite the extremely high single doses that were used, there were only very minimal toxicities, such as mild mucosal side effects that were observed. Lastly, in October of 2019, the first human patient was treated with flash radiation therapy. So this was a 75-year-old patient who presented with a cuteness T-cell lymphoma, and he was treated with 15, or sorry, with 10 pulses of 1.5 gray with a mean dose rate of 167 grays per second. Now, after three weeks, there, were, there was only a grade one epithelitis and a grade one oedema, which, was, which were observed as a result of the treatment. And this is compared to the patient's other lesions, which were treated with conventional radiotherapy and had acute reactions, which took approximately three to four months to heal. So while this is great, there's still no agreement on what the mechanisms behind flash radiation therapy are, what causes the flash effect. So a little bit of background, um, in radiation therapy, the role of oxygen is known to play an extremely important role, and the presence <coughs> of oxi oxygen sensitizes cells to radiation-induced damage. And this is quantified by the oxygen enhancement ratio. So this oxygen effect is described by a two-step model, where 
you have the oxygen enhanced formulation of free radicals and then these radicals go on to fix the radiation induced damage resulting in what's known as the oxygen fixation hypothesis. So the flash effect, although it wasn't called that back then, was actually first observed in 1959 when the authors Dewey and Bogue irradiated a bacterium at 1% oxygenation. So they observed that the oxygen effect, which they would normally see in, uh, sorry, at conventional dose rates, very quickly disappeared when they were delivering high dose rate pulsed radiation. So this was actually later confirmed by Et et al, who produced a family of breaking curves for the irradiation of E. coli. So you can see here, basically what he did is he irradiated E. coli at various levels of oxygenation. So initially, the cell survival curve follows what you might expect for an oxygenated sample, but he noted that at these very high dose rates, you quickly depleted the oxygen in the sample and it began to follow a hypoxic cell survival curve. So the authors attributed this to the depletion of radiolytic oxygen in these cells uh, in a time scale that was shorter than the time oxygen could diffuse back into the shell cells owing to the short time scale of the treatment. So these authors further expanded upon this by utilizing an airtight container that didn't allow for oxygen flow and they were actually able to find the rate at which oxygen depleted from cells due to uh, radiation therapy. And further studies by the authors Ling actually utilized two electron pulses uh, separated by three nanoseconds, with the key idea being that if the first pulse depleted all the oxygen in the sample, they could work out the lifetime of the radiation-induced oxygen damage through analysis of the survival curve from the second pulse, and they found this to be three milliseconds. So when we compare the relatively fast time scale of oxygen dissociation from hemoglobin and the radiation-induced oxygen damage to the approximate one second it takes oxygen to diffuse from the vascular structure into the healthy tissues, it's very likely that these breaking curves are caused by the radiolytic depletion of oxygen in these cells, um, which effectively induces a radiation-induced transient hypoxia and an increased radiosensitivity. So... Initially, this effect was actually not thought to be useful because healthy tissues are extremely well oxygenated. So in order to deplete the oxygen in healthy tissues and, and get this supposed radio protection, uh, you would need extremely high doses in order to actually deplete all this oxygen, which isn't really practical. And it was basically thought that because of this, it would have no sparing effect on the healthy tissues and could potentially be detrimental to achieving tumour control. Um, and in fact, studies in 1972 actually reported no flash effect for the ultra-high dose rate irradiation of fully oxygenated tissues. Despite this contradiction, however, in recent studies, as I showed you before, they would suggest that flash radiotherapy allows for a differential sparing of tissue. And this study here, uh, which involved the irradiation of zebrafish embryos, actually showed that there was a lower frequency of morphological alterations at flash dose rates compared to conventional dose rates. But what they actually found is that as the dose was increased, this differential also increased, which is supportive of this oxygen depletion mechanism. So based on this evidence, uh, a recent letter by uh, Prax et al. proposed a potential mechanism for this flash effect. And they believe it to be due to the selective sparing of stem cells, which reside in hypoxic niches in the healthy tissues. So we know these stem cells play an important role in the recovery of radiation-induced damage. Studies have shown that the transplantation of human embryonic stem cells can basically reduce radiation-induced impairment. Um, and direct measurements of stem cell microenvironments have actually demonstrated that these stem cells may reside in hypoxic environments. And we have found hypoxic stem cell niches in the bone marrow, in neural stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells, and hematopoietic stem cells, which is all reviewed by this author here. So in 2019, this author then decided to create a computational model for the radiolytic depletion of oxygen in terms of the oxygen enhancement ratio. And his model basically showed a few important things. It considered the oxygen diffusion through healthy tissue, its consumption by the cells, the radiolytic, depre the radiolytic depletion, 
and it basically predicted that the flash effect should gradually disappear as the pulse rate increases, dose should be deposited using the smallest number of pulses to accentuate the flash effect, uh, a flash effect should only be observed in cells which are already hypoxic or close to it, and changes in capillary oxygen attention should deplete the, the flash effect. However, as this is a very recent study, none of these predictions have been verified experimentally. So, one of the primary challenges with performing experiments in regards to flash radiotherapy is actually having access to an ultra-high dose rate of radiator capable of producing such dose rates. And many centers actually opt to use proton beams for this purpose because it's quite easy to get high dose rates within the Bragg peak. So um, this brings us basically to the main aim of my project, uh, where I would like to modify the variant IX linear accelerator in the Mary bunker for the delivery of a mega voltage electron beam at flash radiotherapy dose rates. So there are two research groups which have actually been successful in modifying a clinical linear accelerator for the delivery of flash radiation. And this was a research group, uh, Lempart et al, I believe in Lund University, who performed a set of modifications to deliver ultra high dose rate using an Electra Precise, and also Schuler et al of Stanford University who presented a methodology for modifying a variant Clinac 21EX for ultra-high dose rate irradiation. So the modifications these authors made to the Linac ranged from simple changes, such as removing all collimation from the beam and rotating the Linac head to 180 degrees, to more complex modifications, such as adjust adjusting and optimizing the beam injector current, the pulse-forming network voltage, and the beam steering values. And these are all in an effort to try and increase the dose rate that the LINAC can output. Now, the authors of the Stanford Research Group actually performed all of these changes using a spare 20 MeV program printed circuit board. And what the benefit of this is, is we can actually remove the circuit board from the LINAC that has all of its current clinical settings, and we can use an alternate circuit board with these modifications which means we can preserve the clinical settings of the LINAC so that it can be easily reversed should it need to be. Um, and actually, we contacted the authors of the Stanford Research Group, and in an email from the lead physicist in that group, he told us that they utilize a 20 MeV electron beam setting, which they tuned down to 16 MeV with a 16 MeV scattering foil. And the key insight that they had was they operated this 16 MeV electron beam in a photon mode setting because photon mode actually has a higher beam current to account for the attenuation at the target. So you can get a higher dose rate in this way. So with these modifications, these authors were able to obtain dose rates ranging from 900 grays per second at the ionization chamber to 70 grays per second at the position of the jaws. And all the measured beam profiles were slightly asymmetric and approximately 3% variation across the field. So one problem with this study uh, that we might face is that ionization chambers are, well, that we will face, actually, ionization chambers are unsuitable for dosimetry at ultra-high dose rates. So as a result, we can't rely on the internal LINAC ionization chamber for determining how much dose we're delivering or for monitoring of the beam profile and hence, in order to actually protect the ionization chamber, we'll either need to remove it or have its positioning and dosimetry servos disabled. Um, as a result, to ensure the accuracy in dose delivery, we can control the dose delivered by using an electron pulse-based delivery system. So effectively, we'll have electron, pulse, sorry, electron pulses of a known dose, and we'll use a microcontroller, which can control the amount of pulses we deliver so we can deliver a certain number of pulses corresponding to a certain radiation dose. So for measurement of the beam profile, we can actually use gaff chromic film, as it's been shown to be dose rate independent up to 3,000 grays per second with acceptable uncertainty. Um, so one of the main problems actually with the study done by the Stanford and Lund University group is that the flash dose rates they achieved were only achieved for very small treatment fields, within the linear accelerator treatment head um, because they took advantage of a shorter source to surface distance in order to improve the dose rate. In our case, however, we'd like to produce a broadened beam for superficial electron treatments which could potentially be used for humans. 
Um, and as a result, it'll be necessary for us to optimize a series of scatterers or filters in order to broaden the beam while also preserving the high dose rate. And this is basically going to be a trade-off between the dose rate and the beam shaping. So in order to achieve this, we plan to simulate the variant IX using a program like Gantt 4. So Gantt 4 is a platform which allows for the Monte Carlo simulation of particles through matter. And in this way, we can basically create a virtual model of the linear accelerator. And beginning with an electron phase space profile, we can simulate the beam line and perform measurements of the lateral and depth dose profiles, which we can expect entirely within this virtual environment. So this model can be benchmarked against the true LINAC by comparing our simulated measurements to real measurements we make with gap chromic film to make sure it's highly accurate. And basically, by performing these simulated measurements of the obtained profiles, we could, in theory, manually tweak the LINAC design in order to determine an optimal set of modifications to make to the LINAC to give us the optimal beam profile without actually making any physical changes to the LINAC itself. And these parameters could then be translated over to the real LINAC, which could then be benchmarked against the model. So, uh, in our case, we'd actually like to develop an algorithm that's capable of performing an iterative set of simulations in order to basically find the best solution to our problem and automatically optimize the beamline <coughs> through repeated iterations. So uh, lastly, in regards to radiation safety, um, this project won't pose any issues in regards to radiation safety for a number of reasons. The first reason is that we plan to utilize electron beams, which are much more readily attenuated than photon irradiation. Uh, we're not actually increasing the output of the LINAC, as we plan to use the 6 MeV photon mode without a target, uh, and we're delivering the same radiation dose, just faster. Uh, in addition, the energy we're using is low, so neutron radiation will not be an issue, and the beam will only be running for a few milliseconds at a time. Um, we actually confirmed with Peter Maxim again in email uh, about the radiation safety concerns for this project, and he pretty much echoed these thoughts. So there were some initial concerns over the instantaneous dose rate associated with this project. However, um, I took the data that we generated at the time of commissioning this linear accelerator and worked out that the time average dose rate is only 0.8. 0.2 microsieverts per hour in the worst case scenario, which is well under the 20 microsieverts per hour limit. Uh, and thanks everyone for listening. <laughs>